human toxicology. So what is a medical toxicologist? Uh, first, a lot of people don't really know what that is. It's, you know, it's kind of a small uh, niche uh, specialty. But the medical toxicologists are physicians that specialize in preventing, evaluating, diagnosing, treating, and monitoring of an injury or illness from a toxic exposure. And again, I want to emphasize again that these uh, we're physicians who are medical toxicologists, and so we're really some of the only people that can do really clinical evaluations, make a diagnosis, that's what the doctors do, and then maybe a treatment plan. And so we do that, you know, for toxicology. Whereas there are some other people who have, you know, expertise in toxicology, uh, you know, PhDs, PharmDs, et cetera, and have a great knowledge base. You know, we're the ones who are clinicians and actually you know, practice on the patients. So currently in the United States, uh, toxicology fellowships are, are two years uh, in length, and they provide uh, fellows with experience in the clinical practice of medical toxicology, and then prepares you to be able to practice uh, medical toxicology either in an academic or in a clinical setting. A little bit of history, and this uh, you know, even predates myself. Um, the, there was a, a board called the American Board of Medical Toxicology, which uh, no longer exists. It was kind of an independent board because this wasn't a recognized specialty um, by the American Board of uh, Medical Specialties in the United States. They gave their first exam in, in 1975, um, so quite a few years ago, almost 50 years ago. Uh, it's interesting that they would do the exam at the national meeting that occurred with, uh, in conjunction with the poison centers, and now it's called the North American Congress of Clinical Toxicology. And it was a two-day exam. And then the board would meet, um, and, and they would announce the people who passed the exam at the meeting by your score. So if you just barely passed, you may be the first name that they announce, and you get to walk up and get your certificate. And then they would keep announcing until they get the the highest score. So a little bit of a little bit of pressure how they administer that exam. Uh, then the specialty started growing in a big enough number, and they decided to try to you know, make this a, a recognized clinical specialty in the United States. So uh, a couple of other recognized boards, emergency medicine board, uh, pediatric board, and preventive medicine boards. Uh, went to the American Board of Medical Subspecialties and says, hey, we want to, we think this has its own unique content, it especially does, um, and we want this to be recognized and certified. And they applied for it and, um, and then it got approved um, by the ABMS, and so we've been uh, a recognized uh, medical subspecialty in the United States then since uh, 1993. Uh, they gave their first exam in 1994, um, and that's when, um, that's when I started my, my fellowship training. I remember my, my attendings, you know, studying for that exam having to take that. Um, and then for the first about six years or so, they had to call you the grandfather clause in that um, people could apply to take the board even though they didn't uh, they go through an ACG accredited fellowship. There were fellowships that were great um, and they trained people in it, but they were varying in length, maybe varying in content. Um, so they had what's called the grandfather clause you could apply to take it either through the clinical pathway or because you did have some sort of a training program and then sit for the boards. Uh, but then um, it, the, the fellowships then became accredited by uh, ACGME, which is the accrediting uh, body in the United States uh, for training programs. And then after that, then everyone has to go through um, an accredited uh, program to be able to be eligible to sit for the board exam and become a board certified toxicologist. So again, uh, American College of Graduate Medical Education is the accrediting exam or accrediting organization, I should say, for uh, all training programs in the United States. They also have an international arm, uh, the ACGMEI, that you may have heard of or be familiar with. Um, so I know that the, they have expanded into the um, other parts of the world, including the Middle East. And initially, you have to have a program information form. It's basically your application. It's uh, you know uh, it's about 100 pages um, or so. And then they have a site visit would actually come to your, your program and, um, you know, and see how it works um, and talk to everybody and make sure to meet all their criteria. And if you do an annual update, there's usually a couple of annual surveys that they make your, your fellows complete and your faculty make sure that you're, you're keeping up to date on everything. And then they usually make you go through this cycle about every 10 years. Since it was uh, approved by, uh, or went through the boards of emergency medicine, preventive medicine, um, that your sponsored institution has to have a, a training program or one of those to be able to have a medical toxicology training program. So, um, so pretty much all of um, the training programs in the U.S. for medical toxicology uh, are, are 
associated with an emergency medicine training program. There's common program requirements um, that occur for all residencies in the United States. And most of these are like administrative ones, about how many times you get to do evaluations, um, you know, different requirements for your faculty, uh, different scholarly activity that you have to do. And then you have evaluations um, of your trainee that um, look at these kind of core areas, you know, your, the, the fellow's ability to do patient care, their, their knowledge baseline, um, their professional behavior, interpersonal communication skills, and then how they work um, you know, in the system as far as ordering tests and those types of things. To be eligible to go into um, one of our training programs, um, you know, the, they have the, the primary, the resident has to either have graduated from um, a, a primary residency, and these are usually, uh, you know, three-year training programs, there are also some other training programs, one in the United States, um, the AOA, which is osteopathic training programs, a little bit different than, um, than what the majority of us go through, but they can, they're eligible for it. Um, and then you can also, um, if you graduate from an ACGMEI training program, uh, then you are eligible to go into an ACGME fellowship. And we've had have trainees um, from other parts of non-US uh, trainees, who uh, one come to mind is from Lebanon, who, their emergency medicine residency is AGGMEI, and, sh and uh, she came and trained with us for two years in our fellowship. Um, the border is also open for Canadians. Um, we have a reciprocity agreement um, with, with the, the, the country of Canada for our training programs. Um, and then there's also uh, one caveat um, as well that um, if you have a, an exceptionally qualified international graduate, um, that you can go th there is a, a chance to go through an application um, to get that individual to be able to go into your program. Um, and so uh, that way you potentially can take uh, anyone in any other part of the world if you think they are um, exceptionally qualified and your institution has to back you up and agree that they are. And then there, there's a few special hoops they have to jump through uh, as well to be, to be eligible, but um, that sometimes gets applied. And as I mentioned before, your, your institution has to have um, you know, a training program and uh, either preventive medicine or in most of us have uh, emergency medicine. Your clinical facilities to offer this training program, uh, you have to have uh, obviously an emergency department for both adult and pediatrics because um, you, know, you, you need to see both uh, types of patients. Uh, you must have inpatient facilities for both of them. And they don't necessarily have to be at your main hospital, right? So like in, in Atlanta, we have uh, our pediatric hospitals are separate um, you know, from our adult hospitals, um, but we have an affiliation with them, so our fellows can go and, and you know, get the experience of seeing, um, seeing kids. You have to have intensive care units, because that's where a lot of uh, you know, sick uh, toxicology patients will end up being admitted to. Um, you have to have outpatient facilities, which we'll talk a little bit about, um, you know, having a clinic to see people who have occupational environmental exposures or follow up on some of your inpatients. Um, you have to have a tox lab that's available uh, 24 hours uh, a day so you can take care of these patients whenever they present. That's a lot of times they don't present, you know, during uh, nine to five hours. Uh, and you also have to have uh, dialysis capabilities 24 hours a day because there are um, you know, a few toxins that um, you can benefit from, from dialysis. And as far as the clinical experience that they are, they are required but ACG need to have, uh, so you have to have affiliation with the poison center, and having a poison center um, you really increases your, the volume of the, the cases that you see, right? Because uh, one hospital is only going to get you know, so many overdoses or intoxications, but if you have a poison center where they're, they're serving many hospitals, you know, then your fellows are going to get a lot more experience. Um, and so they have to have um, at least 240 uh, cases during their training period uh, through the poison center. Um, we have a really busy poison center, and our fellows probably meet this um, you know, easily within like the first month of training. Uh, but you have to, um, again, be the uh, physician who's at the bedside providing these toxicology services at least 200 times in two years, which is a, kind of a low ball number, not, 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 a, not a real high number. Um, and our fellows will meet this usually easily within a year. And you have to have 10% of those patients be pediatric. Um, so at least have to have at least 20 um, during their training period. And then you have to have a clinic um, as well, because um, we think there's a, you know, a big role um, to play for toxicologists in, in evaluating occupational and environmental uh, diseases uh, from different substances, and not just the acute overdose patients, which a lot of us think about when we think about toxicology. 
Um, and so with that, again, that number is not, uh, not, not a huge number. You only have to see 25 patients um, over the course of two years. The core content, or what our, what our curriculum is about, and developed um, you know, slowly over the years. The uh, first time was in 1994, uh, when it got recognized as a specialty. Um, and then it's been updated roughly about every, uh, about every 10 years. Um, the last time was in, um, in 2021, where it was published in the Journal of Medical Toxicology. And some of these are things that are core content, which you would, you would think they, the toxicologist should know. Um, you know, principles of toxicology, which really is getting into kinetics, um, you know, et cetera. Um, different toxicants and toxins, specific substances you need to know about. Uh, your clinical assessment, um, like vital sign changes produced by toxins, um, et cetera. Different, um, which organ system gets affected by different uh, toxins. Therapeutics are ways to treat people um, who are having uh, problems with substances and toxicology. Uh, and then, you know, we're getting a little bit bigger into uh, population health, because that's one of the one of the critical things that toxicologists can do is combining um, you know, with your government services um, to keep your, your population healthy um, and, and more about in a public health uh, perspective as opposed to just treating the individual patient. Um, then laboratory and analytical uh, forensics um, uh, as part of our curriculum so you can understand drug testing and, and, and ordering of these substances. And, and then three, we're just adding the last uh, last section or last time this was published is environmental toxicology. Uh, we have a, a big problem, obviously, in the, in the U.S. with uh, substance use and addiction, and so that part of our curriculum has really been been um, expanded uh, to get toxicologists involved in uh, in helping combat that uh, the surge in, uh, in mostly opiate use disorder that, that we see, and then occupational toxicology as well. As far as the number of programs um, in the United States, uh, there are a total of 28, so uh, not, not a huge number compared to a lot of other uh, specialties. Um, but again, medical toxicology is still, um, you know, it's a, it's a small niche um, and one of the more recent specialties, so it's hard to get uh, funding to, to um, uh, for your fellow to get paid to just be uh, a fellow in toxicology, to be a resident. And so a lot of programs then have to have them um, work some, someone on the side, like in the emergency department, um, a, a few days um, or a day or so a week uh, to kind of make their salary. Um, you see 20 to 28 have to do that. Uh, we're lucky in, the, in Atlanta, we're one of the programs that doesn't have to do that. So, um, uh, you know, so our fellows can just concentrate on being a, a toxicologist or toxicology training if that's what they want to do. Um, 16 of these 28 say they're willing to take international graduates. Um, which is which is fantastic because we want this specialty you know, to, to spread uh, internationally. Um, we, we do have a little bit of a, of a problem. Um, it's not considered a problem. You know, I love emergency medicine because I'm an emergency medicine physician. That the vast majority of people who go into this training are emergency medicine physicians. Um, it was kind of uh, toxicology was somewhat started by pediatricians more in, in our country. Um, but to now in the past uh, several decades, it's been taken over by emergency medicine specialists. Um, and you know, we, a lot of emergency medicine specialists have a little bit of a limited view, just you know, think about the emergency department. Um, so we're not necessarily trained during our primary specialties to go up on the floors and work in ICUs and work in clinics. Um, and so adding uh, physicians from other specialties, um, you know, I think can help um, you know, expand our, our knowledge base and, and our clinical reach. So we have um, uh, you know, a residency match. So uh, the last year, last time this was done was uh, last fall. We're currently in the application cycle, uh, but in the, in the 2021 um, match, uh, again, there were 28 programs that uh, had spots, um, and 24 of them uh, filled. So obviously, four of them did not fill with a match. Uh, we had 50 applicants uh, last year in our, in our country that went into medical toxicology, which is one of the largest numbers uh, that we've ever had. Most of the times we're, we're in the 30s. Um, and those individuals, you look at them, um, one of them was a, a U.S. Uh, citizen who um, you know, was foreign trained and then came back to the U.S. Uh, 40 of them were um, uh, MD graduates from the U.S. who did a primary residency in the U.S. And then we had three physicians who were foreign, um, who you know, did their training outside the U.S. And then, um, and for, as far as their medical school and their primary residency, that they were accepted into um, into our training programs. 
and then uh, and then we had uh, six that were uh, doctor, doctors of osteopathic medicine, um, which is very similar to MDs uh, in our country. And our numbers uh, for for 2022 look like they're going to be similar to this, with um, um, you know, pretty, probably pretty close to 50. We have 35 applicants just to to our program, so we think that's going to be another uh, a, a big year for for med talks. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to uh, ask Dr. Morgan to join us on, on the uh, dice here uh, while we just uh, get our next speaker, Dr. Badia Hattabi. We'll take questions at the end. We'll have about 10 minutes for Q&A, so get them ready, please. Dr. Badia Hattabi is um, the president of the Middle East and North Africa Clinical Oncology Association, Mina Talks. She is a consultant in emergency medicine and medical oncology at Royal Hospital in Muscat, Oman. And she is uh, the director of the Poison uh, Control uh, uh, Center in uh, Oman, uh, Ministry of Health. Dr. Badria trained in emergency medicine at the, uh, in Oman and then completed a, a, a fellowship in medical oncology at Emory University in 2015? Uh, 14, 2014. And uh, she's one of the leaders of uh, uh, medical oncology in, in our region and is going to talk to us a little bit about the same question, but in the uh, Arab world. Dr. Thank you so much, uh, Kazi, for the introduction. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, good night, and everybody. Uh, thank you so much, Ainul, for having us here. We are delighted and honored to be uh, with such lovely group. Um, well, I don't, you know, I don't have that much expertise on how it's going in the, you know, the Arab world in details, but I'm just going to give you some an overview about the uh, medical toxicology uh, as a specialty in the Arab countries. So I will just touch base about the poison centers in the region and uh, different uh, capacities and how we are struggling to get that um, functioning. And then I will go through the medical toxicology training in the region at the different levels as well. So probably everybody knows what we mean by the Arab world. So we have uh, different countries, so we have the African countries, we have the Gulf countries where I come from, and then we have the Levant countries uh, top there. Now, I mean, toxicology is not something that is, uh, you know, strange to the region. There are many uh, publications that address this since centuries, basically. Probably the most famous one was the, uh, the Khibab of uh, Sumum, that been published by uh, Abu Mahshira basically back in the 1900s. And this was one of the uh, treasure books that been addressed even by the kings. They keep it reserved because it touched different types of poisoning, how patients get exposed to it, what is the sort of the way of treatment, and what different antidotes is available in the, uh, in the, you know, in the country at that time. It's also uh, it's, um, in, the, uh, you know, in Egypt basically, there are many uh, publications address different envenomations specifically for the scorpions and the snakes. And probably you know the story about Cleopatra and how she was killed. Now, if I um, you know, <coughs> summarize the status of the clinical toxicology in general in the um, Arab countries, you can see that you know the majority of us, we might have uh, some sort of a poison information uh, service that provide basically the basic function of most of the poison centers. But that modality is it's different based on which country you're coming from. So there are countries that they focus on hospital-based service, there are countries that they have a dedicated poison center. Now, the, the capacity of a poison center has been addressed is not something that is, you know, um, simple. There are many categories that has to be uh, checked in order to say you have a poison center. Now, uh, for the, when we come to the training uh, for toxicology, the undergraduate teaching on the column here, you can see there are actually not many countries that they address that, or at least we don't know that, whether they have such uh, structure or not. When it comes to the uh, medical toxicology as a um, master or a PhD, you can see that the Arab countries, they don't have that field of, you know, specific for uh, physicians. You might have that for the laboratories, you might have that for the pharmacists, but basically not for um, uh, 
uh, physicians. Now, when it comes to the uh, clinical toxicology as a specialty for residency or a fellowship, you can see there is plus or minus also in the Arab countries. We're not sure whether we have that or not. And certainly, we don't have a national board of toxicology. Um, I took a few examples just to highlight how uh, the structure is basically. So, if you can see that, for example, in Egypt, they have different types, at least eight poison centers that have been addressed in their websites to be, uh, you know, considered taking care of uh, poison patients. Probably they have uh, two uh, hospital-based uh, service that they provide uh, care for poison patients. The famous one is Ayn Shams University. They have 24-7 uh, in-hospital uh, capacity. And they have around, um, you know, 31 inpatient beds, and they have an ICU beds as well that they can take care of patients. Morocco also have, uh, Morocco have also the, uh, the Moroccan uh, pharmacovigilance and poison control center, so it's basically more of a drug information as well. It's been established for a long time, since 1989, and it, it, it addresses different things. They uh, basically also touch base the analytic and toxicology. They have their own publication and they do treat uh, and train, sorry, they do train uh, physicians and uh, pharmacists in toxicology. But they don't, unfortunately, there is no specific degree that they come out with. Um, I will just talk a little bit about the situation in Oman because that's what we've been struggling since I joined in 2014. And recently, in 2022, we were able to launch what is called um, uh, the Oman Poison Control Center. We still did not reach the full capacity of the center. We are located under the Ministry of Health. We have a staff that they are capable of handling um, poison cases. Um, most of our uh, staff are basically nurses. And uh, we have the health educators that give, you know, constant, uh, uh, information and, and education for the public. Um, we are currently uh, five medical toxicologists in the region. We've been trained in um, North America at a different stage. We are proud to be grads from Emory. I have myself and then Dr. Nadia Hajri, Dr. Walid Sikati, Dr. Saad al Abri, and Dr. Hassan al -Bilushi. And currently at Emory, we have two uh, fellows under training also that they are going to join us after they finish. We have an, um, uh, all, we are all based in uh, emergency physicians, based in hospitals, so we do uh, clinical toxicology service also in the hospitals. We are almost on call 24 seven, and we do cover uh, inpatient toxicology service in dedicated hospitals that we belong to. Now, when it comes to the uh, medical toxicology training, okay, um, basically, again, I will focus on uh, man. We uh, have uh, either undergrad uh, or postgrad education. When it comes to the undergrads, we have uh, medical students, and we also have some um, in touch with the uh, pharmacy college. And so we do teach also um, toxicology in, in these two. For the medical students, they have to rotate in um, emergency uh, uh, departments for about a month, and through that, is uh, toxicology is part of the, their education. When it comes to the uh, postgrad, it's either through the residency, and unfortunately, we don't have a medical toxicology fellowship. But I will address what we propose through Minatex and being partially approved this year. So in the emergency medicine, or probably some of you attended uh, some of the activities that we do, is uh, we have a three weeks uh, duration at the Oman Medical Speciality Board where the residents have to do a tox rotation in the center. They have dedicated lectures, they have uh, case-based discussions, simulation and all of that. And we also, uh, we are delighted with the support of Minatox to have this monthly uh, Minatox round that is dedicated one hour for the residents which basically will sum up of 13 hours per year. Uh, that have been said, we have a full structure of, uh, as a curriculum only for emergency uh, medicine. Unfortunately, the only uh, other residency is pediatric that they started a little bit to pay attention to the to 
toxicology and teach the residents, but the rest unfortunately did not do that. Now, um, when it comes, as I said, to the uh, fellowship, we, um, at Minatox, we address this need that we really have to have some sort of formal training for uh, people who they are interested in, probably they will not be able to go abroad to do their um, uh, training. So we did in collaboration with the Arab Board of Emergency Medicine, we started um, you know, putting together a fellowship program that is initially approved uh, by the Arab Board. And the mission was to train physicians who have graduated from a primary specialty uh, in the subspecialty of medical medicine. <coughs> It's basically the duration is 24 months, two years, and the scope is included different uh, aspects in medical toxicology, like adverse drug events, pharmacovigilance, analytical toxicology, forensic principles. And it, it's actually a competency-based program, and usually when uh, you know, they get graduated, they will guarantee um, a, you know, a degree in a medical toxicology. They've been approved by the Arab world. Now, probably I will um, end up by saying that, you know, it's the advancing the training in the region wouldn't have happened without the support of the Middle East and North Africa Clinical Toxicology Association with our annual meeting that we do every year with the um, dedicated people that they constantly there whenever workshops, whenever there is like, you know, specific training, either for the spies or for the physicians. We are always there for them. So in summary, you know, medical toxicology specialty in the region, uh, in the region is relatively new, and we are still, you know, uh, driving there. The collaboration between the organizations and the authorities in the countries is really needed in order we reach to a stage where we should be proud of. So thank you so much for having me. for your nice and informative presentation and uh, as a colleague of yours I'm so proud of you to what you uh, what you did in your region because you take uh, the more, most challenging steps to make uh, medical toxicology recognized as a subspecialty so we will move on for our next speaker Dr. Mohamed El Amin uh, he is a consultant in internal medicine and clinical toxicologist as the West Madness Poison Unit City Hospital, Birmingham, UK. Also, he is one of the uh, clinical toxicologists of uh, Birmingham Poison Information Center. He is also an clinical lecturer at the University of Warwick. Uh, today, uh, Dr. Mohamed Alamin will present the medical toxicology training in UK. Thank you, Dr. Alamin. Thank, thank you very much. Assalamualaikum. Uh, good morning and thank you for inviting me and having me. Uh, special thanks to my good colleague and friend, uh, Dr. Enil, for inviting us to the beautiful um, city of Trabzon. So, um, my title might slightly confuse because the main theme is medical toxicology, yet now I have clinical toxicology. And this is just one of the tugs and um, friendly arguments that we say we have with our American friends. They like to call it medical toxicology, we call it clinical toxicology in the UK. But essentially, we should be doing the same kind of thing. Um, so, we have a, a different system uh, in the United Kingdom. Um, like everywhere else in the world, people finish um, their medical school, and following medical school, um, all graduates undergo what's now known as foundation training, which is a um, training of two years, um, which is quite general. It's divided into six rotations of um, four months each. And um, in each rotation, the foundation doctors, known as F1 or F2, they go through different specialties, emergency medicine, um, gastroenterology, cardiology, with, with medicine uh, as on call, obstetrics, pediatrics, sometimes public health, sometimes psychiatry, depending on the locations available in a particular hospital or region. The UK is divided into what's known as deaneries. So each deanery has a, its mix of large university hospitals or smaller district general hospitals. 
So you're expected in those two years to go around them just to get like a broad overview and generalist approach to your training um, as a foundation doctor. When people finish their foundation training, generally that's when you make that decision about what kind of medicine you want to go into. Now, for us in the UK, because we're such a small specialty, you could, you could put us pretty much all on one bus. And if anything happens to the bus, that's the end of toxicology in the UK. Um, most of us would have gone through, and this has changed a lot in the last few years, this is the latest kind of version, so the internal medicine training, which is now known as IMT. It used to be called core medical training, which is CMT, and it was for two years, but this has now been extended for three years, where you do general medical training, and this is what was used to be known as the SHO, the Senior House Officer, which I'm sure many of you have heard the term before. A few of us might go through the acute care common stem, which is a bit longer, four years. These are usually trainees who want to do emergency medicine, anesthesia, or critical care. But pretty much most of us have gone through this side of the, the graph. Now, by the time you finish your internal medicine training, which is competency-based training, based on a portfolio with your assessments, you are expected to have attained the membership of the Royal College of Physicians. There are three Royal Colleges, but the exam is a unified exam for the whole of the UK. It's three, um, essentially three parts, part one and part two, which are best of five um, examination questions, and a clinical um, OSCE exam um, with uh, 14 stations. So, to be eligible, you need to have got your foundation training competency, your IMT competency, and your membership or MRCP. And then you apply, and for, but the difference here is that we don't really have a training track specifically called clinical toxicology. What you apply to is clinical pharmacology and therapeutics. And it's a dual program, a competency-based program, which lasts for about four years. So in reality, you'll be doing both internal medicine as well as clinical pharmacology and therapeutics. And uh, this lasts for about four years based on competency, work-based assessments, which are all collected in a, an e-portfolio for each trainee. Um, you're expected to achieve what are known as SIPs, these capabilities in practice. And if you successfully complete the, the program, the General Medical Council, which is the regulatory body in the UK, will give you the Certificate of Completion of Training, or CCT, and you are then added to the GMC Specialist Register, which allows you to work independently as a consultant in general internal medicine and clinical pharmacology. Now, this specialty is also unique in the UK because other specialties, by the time you're coming up to your CCT, you are expected to do an exit exam. CPT, clinical pharmacology, does not have an exit exam. And the reason is it's too small a specialty to have a validated exam. And with clinical toxicology, because we're an even smaller branch of CPT, we don't have our own CCT. That's why we're all clinical pharmacologists rather than clinical toxicologists. If you go and look up my name, you'll think, mm, I know about somebody who says he's a clinical toxicologist, but it doesn't say it on the GMC. Because the workforce is very, very small. And I'll come to that in a second. So, these capabilities are divided into three generic capabilities, clinical capabilities, and specialty capabilities. So, generic, this is to, these are general capabilities which you are expected to develop, um, to develop you into consultant working in the national health system, the NHS. So, obviously you need to function within the organization, with the management systems, the ethical and legal issues, because you're the one in charge, you're the one running these different units, whether they're toxicology or non-toxicology, communication, safety of your patients, quality improvement, research and managing of data, and then also to prepare you to become part of that next generation of teachers and supervisors. The 
Um, the medical, the internal medical um, SIFs, these will include managing an acute unselected take. Now, one of the other differences we have with um, other systems around the world, our emergency medicine, uh, or what used to be as accident and emergency, we now call them the EDs, emergency departments, the shift generally is that they don't keep the patients too long. Stabilize them and then you move them on to the specialty. And that's why until recently we had a target, I think it's, it, we might be scrapping the target because of issues lately, but we had the target that by four hours in the ED, every patient had had a decision made. Are they going to medicine? Are they going to psychiatry? Are they going to surgery? Are they going to um, a different um, specialty? And then that's where the acute internal medicine comes in. So we've got acute internal medicine who look after patients who come from the ED, and we have general internal medicine who look after them generally when they're at the back of the house in the, in the wards. The GIM, the general internal medicine, will participate in what we call the acute unselected take. So myself, I do acute unselected take on weekends where I just see it intoxicated or not, not intoxicated, uh, in different settings, inpatient, outpatient, ambulatory, and, and so, so on. And also just the generalistic, it's a generalistic approach. And lots of people felt we're being too general, but actually when COVID-19 hit, this was pretty much our saviour because then we had a huge reservoir of generalist skills available to call upon. Because when we had lockdown, suddenly, for some reason, all the cancer patients disappeared, nobody had cancer, nobody had a heart attack, nobody had something. They did, but they didn't come to the hospitals. You needed your generalistic um, skills, and this is where it came in handy. But more specifically for CPT, these are the skills that you're looking at. Now you'll notice these are very general skills um, in relation to, um, to uh, clinical pharmacology. Now within these skills, clinical pharmacology, then you have generally the choice of doing a subspecialty. Four of them, clinical toxicology is one, where you will have more intense training on a clinical basis um, for that. Or you could go for hypertension or clinical trials or clinical research. Now, this is the decision aid which a panel looks at every year to see your annual progression. And the progression depends upon each year. Uh, there are multiple reports from your consultants. Your education supervisor meets with you at least twice or three times a year, and they have to confirm that you're meeting uh, the different targets as you're going around. Uh, you have multiple feedback from all your colleagues, from secretaries to nurses to uh, other health workers. And this is where the work-based competencies are, are, are done, where you have what are known as SME supervised learning events. So looking at your take skills, you have to do like six ACATs a year. Each ACAT is five patients that you've seen on the unselected take. CBDs, case-based discussions, um, mini cases where you are seen in a mini clinical evaluation, it could be a consultation, it could be history taking, and project based discussions which are like an audit or a cut throughout your, your training. You need to have two patient surveys, so we need to make sure the patients are happy with, with the treatment, with your management, with your communication. Uh, you have to do a quality improvement project. You have to be involved in teaching as a year as, as you go until you become independently uh, competent and you can act unsupervised at, in your final year. Now, you can add to your clinical experience academic degrees. The main degrees available in the UK is a postgraduate diploma in medical toxicology from Cardiff, which is an online distance based um, degree over one year. If you're successful, you can progress if you have a project to do a, a master's in medical toxicology. Should to add to your to your competence, to your to your knowledge and, and learning. So, as I was saying, it's a very small specialty in the whole of the UK. When I started my training, there were about 74 ph clinical pharmacologists. It's now about 100. But when you look at the number of clinical toxicologists, the consultants were about 16 or 17 of us. And we all share the same national Gibraltar and a few UK overseas territories. But it sounds like a heavy workload. We have four centres, but one of the other differences we have is that we do not take consults 
for the public. The consults we take are from health professionals, the ambulance service, the emergency services, who will look at talk space, and this is our clinical um, guidelines database. That's the first line which health professionals are expected to look at. If it's unclear or more complicated, then they call the MPIS. The MPIS then the, uh, the call is answered by a specialist in poisons information or a spy, as we like to call them. And according to certain severity criteria or complications, then a consultant is consulted about it. Talkspace has about 17,000 agents. It's also available as an app. It's quite um, um, for the NHS people working in the NHS or public health. Uh, the cost is it's a non-profit um, um, venture. And we're there 24, 7, 24 hours, 24-7 throughout the year to, to help. Part of our work includes updating Talkspace entries, so about 4,240. This is from last year's financial year report, were updated. We also keep safety data sheets for um, different products in our product data center. These are our centers, uh, Newcastle where I train, Birmingham where I currently work, Edinburgh where top space is kept and they have editorial um, responsibility in Cardiff. So hospital departments, the telephone advice services, NHS 111 in the UK, NHS 24 in Scotland and NHS Direct in Wales, they get the calls, they call us after that. So that reduces the amount. So we had Talkspace user sessions, about three quarters of a million user sessions in the last year, and it is going up, which is exactly what we want to see. Because we want the bulk of consultations to go through Talkspace, and then only the more severe ones to come through to, to us. Um, so it's manned by the specialists, as I said, Roughly, a few years ago, we had about 45,000 calls a year. It's come down, and we have about 2,366 MPIS consultant referrals. Uh, again, from our colleagues uh, in the telephone advice services and other hospitals. We also have the UK Teratology Information Service, uh, which is a public-facing um, uh, website. And you can see it's quite popular with the number of downloads of information about drugs and integrity, and it continues to grow nicely um, over the last period of uh, last few years, actually. Thank you very much. I think we failed to mention that Dr. Amin, uh, can you join Dr. Amin, can you join us please on the panel? Uh, that he's also a Minatox board member. So, uh, we have to mention that. All right, how about some questions or comments from colleagues here. I know this is a topic that's quite specialized, but I know in the, in the room we have many uh, uh, academicians and educators. Any questions or how do you see this fit in Turkey? Oh, there's one more talk. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. I apologize. Uh, our last speaker is Dr. Eylou Shaheen. Dr. Eylou Shaheen is another board member of Mia Talks who is um, uh, currently in Istanbul, but was until recently at uh, Kadri Technical University at Farabi Hospital. We'll talk, talk about her more later, so I will just for the sake of time, I would just like, like her to present and uh, talk on the training in Turkey. Thanks so much, Dr. Kavazli, for a nice introduction. Um, good morning, Günaydın, uh, welcome everyone. Today I will talk about medical toxicology practice and training uh, from a Turkish perspective. I have no clear to uh, I have no disclosure. So my perspective, uh, I have just uh, graduated three years ago from Emory University uh, School of Medicine International uh, Postdoctoral Fellowship Program in Medical Toxicology. I also did my PhD degree in, at uh, Dokuzeli University, uh, Department of Clinical Pharmacology, Toxicology PhD program. I'm currently consultant in medical toxicology and emergency medicine. And during this time, after my graduation, uh, I and my team established two inpatient tox units. So the first unit that, that we established at Cardiff Technical University uh, uh, at Farabi Hospital, it's the Medical Toxicology Critical Care Unit. 
We established it uh, in 2020. It has 14 bed capacity. Uh, we evaluated 250 patients per year. And this was the first uh, inpatient unit in terms of medical toxicology in our region. And the population that we saw was approximately 1 million. Uh, because I'm now at uh, my new institution, uh, this unit are, uh, is directed by one of my colleagues, Dr. Vila, Vila, uh, with consulting with me. So my new institution, Başakşehir Chan and Sakura City Hospital, we have just established two weeks ago medical toxicology ICU units. Uh, this is the only uh, medical toxicology ICU unit in our country. Uh, we have 16 bed capacity uh, and uh, my institution also has uh, Turkey's third largest hospital. Uh, also, we, uh, we are planning to serve more than 20 million population and this is my team from Başakşehir and I am so uh, appreciated for their support uh, because we, uh, we plan this unit in a very short time. So, as a medical toxicology practice, medical toxicology is not a recognized subspecialty in our country uh, currently. We have a limited number of expertise in medical toxicology. Uh, Turkey has one certificated medical toxicologist who has trained it, and we have lots of emergency medicine specialists and different kinds of specialists in toxicology in doctoral training. Uh, but there are uh, different uh, areas of tox, such as forensic, pharmaceutical, and other kind of toxicology uh, divisions. We have also lots of emergency medicine specialists, pharmacists, pharmacologists, anesthesiologists who are really interested in toxicology. We have a few uh, clinical toxicology PhD programs. Uh, the first one is at Stokuzelin University, which I graduated from. Uh, and the second one, one uh, has established in 2020, it's uh, in Gaziantep University, uh, it, belongs, it belongs to the Department of Emergency Medicine. Uh, but uh, as I mentioned before, there are lots of PhD programs uh, in especially pharmaceutical toxicology. So just three of them have local poison information service and they are only served uh, in morning shifts and they only serve local university hospital healthcare professionals. So future steps that we need to take is set up a medical toxicology fellowship program and we need to collaborate between tox programs and national poison center. We need to improve our interdisciplinary connection with other disciplines. So also I would like to talk about a little bit about National Poison uh, Information Center of Turkey. Uh, it is established in 1986. Uh, they answered uh, approximately uh, 240,000 calls per year uh, and uh, they, only, they serve 90% uh, of healthcare professionals. They have limited staff, unfortunately, so sometimes calls are answered in minutes, sometimes it, 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 it takes longer, like more than 30 minutes. Uh, the poison information officers, uh, there are different clinical backgrounds. Uh, some of them paramedics, nurses, and general practitioners. Also, uh, they have staff who are dentists. Uh, the current challenges, there is a lack of medical supervision. Uh, it's a non-accredited poison information center and the provide, providers uh, has a limited numbers. Uh, there is no follow-ups when you call the poison center. They, uh, told, they uh, tell you what to do but uh, there is no follow-up and there is no recorded medical outcome of the patients. The annual reports are unavailable. The last annual report was published two years ago uh, with the 10 years of silence. So uh, it's not uh, very uh, annual uh, reports available. And also, <coughs> uh, we need to make a strategy for the future. Uh, it's essential to build a medical toxicology a fellowship program as a, a recognized subspecialty in not just our country, in our region. Uh, we need an increased number of medical toxicologists who are on call and who are uh, hands-on in medical toxicology in patient units. Uh, we need to engage a national poison center uh, to do uh, the programs that we are planning to build because uh, there is a really lack of medical supervision uh, in our uh, national poison center. Uh, thank you for your attention.
any more presentations? No. <laughs> this was the last time. All right, going back to what I just mentioned earlier, uh, let's try to discuss a little bit the Turkish perspective based on the models in the UK, the Arab world, as well as uh, in the US. I'd like to ask a question first to, uh, to Dr. Amin. Dr. Amin, I got confused a little bit. You had two years of foundation plus three years of internal medicine. Then you said you have a four-year dual program in internal medicine and clinical pharmacology. Is that basically now nine years or is that something different, that, that four-year program, that dual program? Or does that supplant the two-year internal medicine? So, if you're going to do it um, in minimal time, you are going to do two years of foundation training, which everybody has to do, and then three years of internal medicine, and then four years, so that's nine years. Having said that, there will be a number, so between medical school and becoming a consultant in the shortest time period, and if you clear everything, exams and assessments, nine years will make you a consultant. So why are you doing the internal medicine twice? You're doing the three years, and then you're doing the dual. Because when you finish the um, CPT and GIM, specialty training in four years, you come out as a consultant in both internal medicine and internal pharmacy. Oh, the other one was essential. That, that was the um, IMT. Most uh, medical specialties, the expectation is that you come out with a consultant in general medicine as well as your other specialty, gastro, surgery, and so on. Because of the unique kind of needs of the NHS, that they want more generalists so they're all getting the internal medicine and something. Yes. And then uh, in those four years, do you get the curriculum, the core content, the toxicology that you do in the US? There's a curriculum, yes. There's a curriculum. And um, your assessments are linked to different items in the curriculum, common poisons, environmental, industrial, occupational, um, toxicology, and, uh, and so on. And you all have clinics. At the moment in Birmingham, we're seeing kind of lead patients because of the industrial background to the city. Um, so it, it largely does depend on where, where you get the training and it, and it can be a bit challenging and that's why sometimes between DOEs we have trainees who come and stay with us so a month or two just to um, augment and, and supplement what they that you can add um, just uh, kind of academic kind of background. Uh, especially for internationals this program I think. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, I mean, it's a distance-based um, diploma, so um, probably, I would say, as my supervisor at the time mentioned, described it to me, it, the best bit of it is that it gives you a mental framework um, on how to approach a poison patient. It's probably better for those that do not complete the nine years. Yeah, the target it towards, it's more towards the general people, uh, population, people who are doing emergency medicine, who are just interested but don't want to commit to a career in terms of Thank you. Other questions? Dr. Tushu. Uh, and we would like to 
uh, increased the time uh, and the uh, other uh, disciplines rotations such as uh, emergency medicine uh, the rotations in, in the curriculum. Now we are we are just working hard uh, uh, because uh, uh, we would like to uh, have a space uh, in the uh, medical toxicology uh, uh, subspecial or medical toxicology subspecialty program. Do you mean that there are toxicology PhD programs? Yeah, yeah. Uh, in the pharmacy, pharmacy. Yeah, I, would, yeah. I would like to add. Uh, in the pharmacy faculties, uh, there are also toxicology PhD programs, and uh, we have lots of pharmacists. Uh, taking uh, the toxicology PhD programs, uh, but they are different in uh, pharmacy faculties and medical faculties. So, if we, uh, if the government of Turkey uh, establishes a specialty of, let's say, clinical toxicology or medical toxicology, do you think it would be um, open to both uh, physicians and clinical pharmacists, uh, or do you think it will be no, separate? No, uh, my idea is. Uh, physicians uh, must be take uh, uh, in the um, take place in the uh, medical toxicology program, but for the poison centers and other centers, uh, the PhD uh, PhDs or pharmacists can take place. But uh, uh, the medical toxicology or clinical toxicology program is a physician physician based uh, specialty, sub subspecialty. I think. And then uh, perhaps Dr. Gabriel Lopez can maybe shed some light. <laughs> the way the clinical pharmacist, clinical toxicologist interfaces in this picture, at least in the U.S. Would you mind, Dr. Lopez, to give you the microphone? Yeah, but, uh, I'm sorry, but uh, in the, uh, uh, 30 years ago, uh, I got a, a clinical toxicologist training in, in the United States, and uh, I, know, uh, the, I know the, uh, the system, uh, but what uh, the, uh, in the program? Uh, I agree, and I agree with that, but, uh, but Dr. Lopez okay. has maybe more up-to-date Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank, Thank you. I think, if you're, I think this is uh, kind of the, what Dr. Amin was saying about medical toxicology versus clinical toxicology and how we deal with it. Good morning. I'm uh, Gaylord Lopez. I'm the executive director of the a little bit difference in nomenclature, uh, 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 Dr. Amin, um, in that the clinical toxicologists are non physicians. The importance of clinical toxicologists in our country is that the pharmacists uh, are the ones who are primarily the ones running poison information centers. And in my discussion uh, a little bit later today, I'm going to be talking about the importance of having a poison center, not necessarily run by physicians, but run by clinical toxicologists, and then uh, with the staff of either pharmacists or nurses who serve as the people who run the call center. And so I think what's making our program successful in the States is that you have clinical toxicologists, the non-physicians, working side by side with the medical toxicologists. And although we, we don't do the diagnosing as Dr. Morgan uh, uh, has uh, outlined, um, we are, I think, quite instrumental in providing more pharmacology support, more pharmacokinetic support. And so I think as you look to extend, uh, expand programs in the MENA region, in Turkey, medical toxicologists by the bedside. Uh, but in our country, the majority of work uh, is done by non-physicians and the more critical cases which require the expertise should be handled by the medical toxicity very successful. And this afternoon when I talk about uh, the need and the importance, you'll see that having a poison information center is going to be critical not only uh, for uh, outcomes of your patients, but you know we'll be able to show you that working alongside other medical toxicologists will make for the perfect marriage of toxicology. And I remember Dr. Goldfrank once told me, uh, Dr. Lewis Goldfrank told me that uh, there, are, there aren't enough of us anyway, whether we are medical or clinical toxicologists, and we call them different names, 
but at the end of the day we serve the same mission. But it's important and healthy to also understand the differences. Uh, so I, I wish uh, Turkey the best of luck in uh, this important, uh, necessary uh, journey for you to really establish a specialty. I've always uh, I grew up Thank you so much. I would like to ask uh, a couple of things. Uh, and first of all, I would like to thank all the speakers and all the participants uh, for their attention and their support for our country. Because these patients, poisoned patients, uh, needs to be taken care of uh, the, the medical toxicologists. Otherwise, just uh, running just a poison center, just running a telephone consultation, uh, they that won't uh, increase the impact of the importance of medical toxicology. So I hope. Thank you.